So I got my hands on some pretty sweet thermal pads and I thought to myself, why would I just waste these on me when I could share them all with you? So of course, before you get started, it is advisable that you have the correct tools on hand. Over here, I have a small electronics repair kit. This has a screwdriver and some plastic doodads that I'm able to, you know, fiddly off all the little gunk. And of course, a multitude of heads for me to undo all of the variety of screws that you'll find on the average GPU. Um, some thermal pads are extremely important. For this one, I'm using the critical thermal pads. These are the special 20 WMK pads. Uh, that I've ordered custom from Critical, who's also made a video like this, and I apologize for doing it, but I really wanted to do it. You can also use something like these Thermal Right Extreme pads. You'll have to buy them in multiple sizes and cut them to size, um, but they work just fine. Uh, they're not quite as high WMK. These are only 12.8, but they still work very well. I use them on all my other GDDR6 cards. Um, something like the Gelid Ultimates or the Fuji Polys are also extremely good options. Of course, to be able to cut those, you will require one of these, which is a standard X-Acto knife, and it is extremely sharp, and I recommend not screwing around with it, but it works extremely well. Um, additionally, you may want to have some of these if you're intending to cool the back plate. You will need some heat sinks. You can get a pack like this, about 10 bucks on Amazon. I'll put a link in the description below. And to attach those, of course, you will require a roll of thermal tape, which is also extremely cheap on Amazon. Uh, a standard Phillip head screwdriver, a standard flathead screwdriver, a pair of scissors, and of course, a bottle of isopropyl alcohol. 99% is preferred because it will come off the cleanest and a microfiber cloth. You can, of course, use a roll of paper towel if you prefer, but microfiber is a lot cleaner and I generally don't recommend it because the paper towel will leave behind little fibers, which, you know, could potentially compromise your cooling somewhat, probably not a whole ton. And of course, a can of compressed air is always a good thing to have around so you can clean out any components that you have and, you know, while you have your case out, you might as well give it a good spritz anyway. Now, a couple notes. There are a series of nut-based screws on here, one here, one here, uh, one over here, and then there's one that's actually underneath. If any of you have watched the Gamers Nexus teardown of this card, you may recognize this as the one that Steve drops into the card itself. You're gonna do it. You're gonna need a pair of needle nose pliers to put it back on. I usually take it off first because then you can shake it out while everything's loose, but it will fall in your card and you're just gonna have to live with that. As has been noted in other videos on this card, the back plate does not have any transfer material on it whatsoever. Um, on my first test, I'm not going to be putting any thermal pads on this, but I will be putting some on uh, on subsequent tests so we can compare those temps. Always remember when you're taking off a bracket, whether it be for a CPU or a GPU or applying the bracket, to take it off at four points in a diamond pattern or pentagram pattern if it's got multiple brackets um, just to ensure that you're relieving tension in a circular, non-circular fashion, sorry, uh, from around the GPU or CPU die. Now, while the back plate comes off with a zero size screw head, uh, you will want to use a double zero, and I almost forgot there, to take off uh, the back bracket. As has been noted numerous times before, when you're working the PCB away from the heatsink, you, of course, want to make sure that you've taken off all the screws, and by this point, you likely should have. You'll want to start from this end because there are no fan headers on this end. Pull it upwards and work your way back, as you saw there, to the point where you're separating. As Steve on Gamers Nexus mentions so many times, you should be at eye level with the card as much as possible so you can ensure that you are not separating anything that you shouldn't. Once you've done that, 
then you can disconnect the fan headers. Now it's worth noting here, even though my fat head gets in the way and you can't see what I'm doing, I'm just using my fat little fingers to unattach each of those plugs. It's not that hard, you don't need to use a tool. Also, of course, worth noting that this card has four headers, uh, and there is another header back here at the end of the card, so make sure you don't forget that and try to yank off the PCB after you get the other three off and potentially cause some issues. So now, assuming that you've detached the PCB from the heatsink uh, successfully and you haven't broken anything or snapped out any of the fan headers or broken a cap or anything like that, now you can go through the meticulous process of cleaning it. And as mentioned before, <laughs> you will benefit from a microfiber cloth and of course some isopropyl alcohol. I will also note that a good small electronics repair kit will have scraping tools inside it as well and you will make great use of those. And in a reasonable amount of time, you will have a mostly clean PCB. It's nearly impossible to get everything off, so don't worry about if you get a little bit here and there. It is non-conductive, um, the type of thermal material that they put on these cards by default. Uh, if you have a little bit left in your VRMs, it's not a big problem. If you have a little bit crusted on the side of the VRAM, that's not an issue either. And of course, uh, GPU dies mm, doesn't even matter nearly as much as it does with CPUs. One thing I will note, when you are cleaning off uh, the cooler itself, the copper that they use for these is extremely soft. Copper in general is a very soft metal. You can see, even with the plastic tooling, I have scored it slightly. So don't do what I did and be a little bit more careful with it. Unfortunately, I'm going in a bit of a hurry right now. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I am using the Critical Custom Kit. These are 20 WMK pads. They are far beyond most of what you'll get on the market. Um, the thermal rate extremes I typically use are 12.8. These are 20s. Uh, Gelid Ultimates are 15 or 16. Fuji Polys are 18. So these are pretty much the pinnacle. They are custom sized and custom fit to fit this card easily and go on without issue, though they do not include any back plate, back plate pads. So I'm gonna have to put those on myself. Each one of these pads is cut specifically to size for the portion that it is going to be going on. You'll notice there is a honeycomb side and a flat side. There's multiple schools of thought on the best way to put these on. Some people put them on the cooler first, other people put them on the VRAM first and on the uh, VRM modules and things like that. I prefer to put them on the PCB myself and then fit the cooler over top. Now, when you are handling thermal pads, you're gonna be trying to do Three things. One, you're going to try to contact the interior side of the pad as little as possible. You'll want to try to keep your contact to where it has the plastic or the shipping plastic over top. You do not want to compromise it. Two, you do not want to flatten it all. These are very specific with, particularly for these EVGA cards, for some reason they use uh, quarter millimeter measurements, which makes them very, very specific compared to a lot of other cards. And of course, three, you want to try to align them with the module as closely as you possibly can with as little overhang as possible. This will guarantee the best contact and the best cooling. Now you'll notice I've been scoring and cutting both the VRAM and the VRM uh, thermal pads. This is because this kit is for a 3080 and a 3080 Ti. 3080 Ti has both a, two additional VRAM modules because it has 12 gigabytes of VRAM versus 10, and it has a different VRM configuration. So I'm gonna have to cut this down to put it over all of the VRMs.
And there you have it, a near re-perfect <laughs> re-padding uh, with 20 WMK mint green delicious looking gumstick pads. Of course, now for the GPU, you can use your favorites thermal paste. Um, I'm going to use uh, Thermal Grizzly Cryonaut, uh, which is only a 12.8 WMK, but these cards don't really have a lot of trouble actually cooling the GPU, so I'm not too worried about it, and that should be more than sufficient. All right, so that's all done. It's all installed. Let's uh, spin it up and let it run for a little while and see how she does. And then we'll move on to the backplate. Now I'll remind everyone that these are RMA pads. I think they're actually better than what EVGA puts on these cards at stock. They peak at about 90 degrees, which isn't terrible. But the critical pads obviously beat the pants off of them. They go from 74 to 78, just out of the box. Amazing. So now that we've set a baseline for what we can get with just those 20 WMKs, which I'm actually really happy with, let's throw some uh, three millimeters on the back plate and see if that makes any difference. These are again, 12.8 WMK, but you know, I got a non-negligible amount of them. So let's just throw them on and see what happens. Now, if I had larger amount of pads, I'd probably make them a little bit wider, um, but overall you can see that they are over the actual VRAM chips on the backside. You can always look underneath and make sure that they line up because you can typically see them through if you go eye to eye with the card. So let's throw the backplate on and give it a test. Didn't see too much of a change with uh, the thermal rights on the back plate. These cards aren't 3090s, they don't have VRAM on the back side, there's not going to be too much of a change. Alright, so I've attached all of these heat sinks they should all be running in the same direction whether that's this way or that way it doesn't really matter on this card the air blows out so we might as well keep everything in line with one another and i'm going to run a test with these by themselves and then i'll run another one with a 120 mil fan blowing downwards on them so we'll take a look in a bit uh, we're seeing pretty similar stuff when you throw some heat sinks on there again there's not going to be a ton of heat transfer so you know but then you throw a fan on top of it and you get a little bit more cooling over the card and a little bit more on there and the difference is actually a bit more, a couple degrees off. So we can see that just changing to the critical pads gives you minus 12 degrees centigrade from what I assume are actually pretty decent pads to begin with. Um, adding all the other stuff, you know, there's probably pretty negligible differences, but then once you throw the fan on, you get a little bit more. Now there's going to be obviously a little bit more power usage, definitely a lot more noise because I put an ML120 on there and I don't know if you guys have heard those, but they are pretty loud. Uh, but at the end of the day, are these critical pads worth buying? Hell yeah. If you have non RMA pads, they are definitely worth buying and even with these rma pads they blow them out of the water these are fantastic and i want to buy more and put them on all my cards but unfortunately i only have one other 3080 so maybe i'll do a quick update with that card because it is a uh full hash rate hybrid card <laughs> 